Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Zach Huntington, and I'm the Associate Director of Clean Virginia Waterways. I'll be moderating today's webinar, which is the last in our Reduce, Reuse, Recycle webinar series, organized in partnership with Environment Virginia, Clean Virginia Waterways, Clean Fairfax, and Lynn Haven River Now. Over the course of this webinar series, we've been looking at emerging solutions to reducing plastic pollution in our waterways, exploring false solutions and issues with plastic recycling, and today, how Virginia is working to eliminate the most harmful single-use plastics. We've been joined throughout the series by experts in the plastic-related waste management, policy, technical solutions, wildlife impacts, and industry solutions. You can watch the recordings of the first two webinars with the links just shared in the chat. Now, our goal over the course of this series is to re-examine the common phrase, reduce, reuse, recycle. We're digging into the questions of, how can we better focus on reducing and reusing? Can we make the three R's even stronger? Is our focus on recycling doing more harm than good? And how can we use the three R's to adopt comprehensive and cohesive policies and systems that move us to a more circular economy? And today, we'll bring everything back home to Virginia to talk about how plastic pollution impacts us here, what we've done to reduce plastic pollution in Virginia, and where we're going from here. And we'll be hearing from some great speakers today. First, we have Mark Swingle with the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center to talk about the impacts of plastic pollution on marine wildlife and Virginia's environment. Next, Jen Cole, the Executive Director of Clean Fairfax, will talk about plastic bag pollution in Northern Virginia, the impacts of the bag fee in Fairfax County, and opportunities for further plastic policy there. Lastly, Molly Riley, Pearl Business and Advocacy Coordinator of Lynn Haven River Now, will provide an update on where Virginia Beach is on passing their bag fee and how we can push it over the finish line. And we have a jam-packed agenda, but we will have a bit of time at the end for questions. You can ask questions in the Q&A section here in the Zoom or using the Google form shared in the chat. And we'll save any questions we do not get to and be sure to get answers to folks after the webinar. Thank you again for joining us. And We'll pass it over to our first speaker, Mark. Okay, Zach, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real honor to join this group today to talk about this topic. And uh, I look forward to speaking with all of you. And uh, if you have some questions, we'll hopefully have time to get to those at the end. Um, as Zach said, my name is Mark Swingle. I'm a uh, I'm the former chief of research and conservation at the aquarium. I retired last year, and I'm still doing some consulting work for the aquarium. Um, the topic we have to talk about today is plastic pollution, and of course, uh, plastic pollution impacts marine animals, and that's that's the area of expertise that I bring to the table today. Because working with the Virginia Aquarium, we've seen this uh, these impacts firsthand. Um, and we'll talk briefly about some of those challenges and, and those impacts and then a little bit about solutions. And I think our other speakers will finish up with that today. Uh, okay, I changed the slide, thank you. Um, as we know, plastic pollution is a global problem and, and the US is right up there in the front. Uh, in terms of generators of plastic waste, we're number one. Uh, more than 42 million metric tons annually and we're also number one in the amount of plastic waste generated per person at more than 250 pounds annually of plastic waste. So, so this is a significant issue for us. Uh, next slide, please. Today, though, um, we want to focus on Virginia, and I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to start out talking a little bit about a, uh, a uh, research project that we did um, a few years ago. Uh, this project was titled Monitoring Marine Debris on Virginia Beaches. And the project was led by the Virginia Aquarium, Clean Virginia Waterways, uh, the Virginia Coastal Zone Management Program, uh, NOAA provided the NOAA Marine Debris Program provided funding, and Christina Trapani Consulting was a major player in this in this project. Next uh, slide. And what you can see with this inset here is, um, and uh, it are the four beaches that we surveyed. So the the idea behind this project is we were going to survey monthly. Um, over, a, over a more than four year period, we were in a survey monthly uh, beaches along Virginia's coastline. And we picked beaches, the northernmost beach there that you can see, uh, the one toward the top of the screen, that's Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge. Um, if you go down a little bit lower there, right at the mouth of the bay, Fisherman Island National Wildlife Refuge. 
Um, over on the uh, over on the peninsula or over on the on the other side of the bay, there is Grandview Nature Preserve, and then the final one down at the bottom is Back Bay National Wildlife Refuge. And the thing I want to point out here about these beaches is that with with only Grandview Nature Park did have some housing nearby. Uh, but the other beaches that we were surveying here, there's nobody that lives there at, at these locations, and in, and some of them are quite remote. There's no there's no really uh, concentrations of uh, housing anywhere near these beaches. So um, anyway, we we conducted surveys on these beaches over more than a four year period. Next slide, please. So in the in the more than 250 sur or more than 200 surveys that were done on these beaches during that time, these are the results that we found. And I'm not going to go through all these numbers. There's a, there's a lot of things on here, but I do want to point out the top one, and that is plastic composed 83% um, of what we discovered on these beaches of the debris on these beaches, and that's not a number that's foreign to anybody that's looked at this issue. Uh, that is actually, that number is consistent worldwide. And when you look at uh, the debris that ends up on, on coastal uh, waterways and, and on ocean beaches. Next slide, please. Again, this is a little bit of a busy slide, maybe a little bit hard for you to see, but I just want to point out a couple of things in here. Um, as you can see, and, and as we said in the previous slide, more than 83% of the debris was plastic debris. And one of the things I want to point out here is that um, just a couple of items. The very first, uh, the very first item on the list is bottles and container caps, and of course that's plastic. Number two on the list are balloons, uh, plastic, mylar, and latex balloons. Um, number six is bottles, plastic bottles, and number eight is plastic bags. Uh, and there's a number of other plastic things in there that I kind of skipped over, but the point is there's a lot of plastic in uh, in the items, and the majority of the items are plastic, and the in the top 10, you have very common plastic items. Next slide, please. I want to mention also that this report that I just mentioned is in the, is in the center of the slide here. Um, and of course, Virginia has a marine debris reduction plan. It was originally created in 2016, and it's recently been updated in 2021. And then it, the other thing I put on this slide is uh, another report about balloons and balloon research, balloon releases and things like that. Now, as you may know, uh, since these reports were done, uh, we have actually been one of the first states in the country to ban the outdoor release of balloons. And that's a great thing for us to have done. The main reason I wanted to show this slide, though, was to point out that you can actually see these reports um, at the they're all they're all downloadable from the Clean Virginia Waterways site on the web. And I think Zach's going to put a link to that in the in your chat or, or in your uh, you should be able to get to that. Next slide, please. Of course. Um, uh, plastic debris is a, is a significant issue, and once it gets into the waterway and into the ocean, then it can cause great harm. Uh, next slide, please. What you see here is a, a report done by the Ocean Conservancy, and this lists the deadliest ocean trash. So this is the this is the ocean trash. Uh, first of all, it's all plastic, by the way. Uh, secondly, it uh, or mostly plastic anyway. And secondly, what you'll see there is number two is plastic bags. Number three is balloons, and number five is bottle caps, so and cigarette butts, and all of those things were in our top ten on our list. So once again, once this this material gets into the water and into the ocean and into the environment, then it poses real and significant problems for marine life. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I couldn't help but mention a couple of things about balloons, and I probably already jumped the gun and said that we've uh, we've uh, actually addressed this problem in a, in a lot of ways in Virginia. But um, clearly, balloons are a significant issue, and uh, they they are prominent on that deadliest ocean trash. And you can see balloons originate from a lot of different places. But the bottom line is, um, when you release a balloon, you're effectively littering because that balloon's going to return to earth somewhere or return into into one of our waterways and you could see how much of that balloon debris was ending up on on Virginia's ocean beaches. Next slide please. 
And when that happens, um, and you can see a few images here from balloons collected from those surveys and from, from those ocean beaches, you can also see a few slides here of balloons that have impacted, balloons and balloon debris that have impacted marine animals. Uh, the picture of the bird there in the center is a uh, shearwater, and this bird washed up at Back Bay National Wildlife Refuge, and it was entangled in, it had balloon and, and of course the ribbon on the balloon, and it was entangled in that. The image you see in the in your upper right is a uh, Kemp's Ridley sea turtle that had ingested a balloon, and the 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 uh, the ribbon from that balloon was still protruding from the mouth of the turtle. Uh, and then in the bottom right, uh, this was a photo from Shinkatig uh, National Wildlife Refuge, and uh, with a horse that had uh, somehow ingested a balloon and debris in its uh, in uh, its habitat up there. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this slide I, I also wanted to include. This is actually a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle that we found um, dead. Uh, it washed up on the beach and it was in tank. This is actually the remains, uh, the debris from a weather balloon. Um, the balloon itself is plastic. The the little case of, of, uh, of instrumentation that it carries along with it is also in plastic. And then it has some line and rope and everything associated with it. Um, this is we, this is not the first time we've seen this in Virginia, and one of the things we've learned in studying this issue is that uh, there are more than a thousand of these balloons released every day around the world, um, and uh, and most of them are never recovered. So they're ending up in the waterways more than likely, or in some remote area, uh, potentially on land. But uh, just another area where plastic pollution can impact uh, marine animals. So I'm going to move on and talk to you a little bit about some very specific cases that we've uh, that we've encountered, uh, just to give you some examples again of uh, the impacts of plastic and plastic pollution on marine animals. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the things you may or may not know is that um, sea turtles are uh, known to eat jellyfish. Uh, you may wonder why. It doesn't seem like it would be very nutritious, but the largest sea turtle that, that's alive today, the leatherback sea turtle, which can reach close to 2,000 pounds, it, it feeds almost exclusively on jellyfish. So um, it can be a, a very nutritious thing. Um, of course, a plastic bag, as you can see in this slide, very much, uh, very much can resemble a jelly-like animal when it's floating around in the water, and um, and uh, and that's the issue for these animals when they see this debris and they see these materials in natural habitat, they confuse it for food, and that's where they they get in trouble. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a this is a very specific case. Um, the 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 photograph in the upper left is actually of a loggerhead, young loggerhead sea turtle, and we we were feeding it some jellyfish. So we took a good photo of it eating, about to eat a jellyfish, just to demonstrate the fact that they do very much like to eat these animals. Um, the photograph on the right is a rate is actually a radiograph of a young green sea turtle that came into the aquarium a few years back. Um, the turtle was nicknamed Kermit, and Kermit came in very thin. Uh, the, you know, we, we see a lot of these animals. We're very familiar with sea turtles. We've studied them for, for decades now. And one of the things that was re really noticed about Kermit was the animal was very thin. It was, it was almost a little bit, almost emaciated. And um, other than that, it looked okay. It didn't have any external injuries that we could see. Uh, in the course of the next, uh, you know, week or so, in terms of we were trying to feed the animal and it was not re really eating very well, and so finally we we were able to get a radiograph of the turtle. And what what you're seeing here in the you can see sort of what looks like a big white mass right behind the head and down into the gut, and that's essentially a big mass of material that's stuck there. It's not it's not going anywhere. It's not getting past the stomach. And this animal, and basically this animal was plugged up with something and was not feeding. Um, then on the lower left, you can see um, one of the veterinarians that we work with and some of our staff. And it's a little hard to see the turtle there, but they, they are doing an endoscopic procedure where they're going down into the turtle's esophagus and removing this, this blockage. We didn't really know what it was at the time, but we 
and it actually took several different procedures to get to get the animal clear. But we were able to remove all the debris from this turtle's um, from this turtle's stomach and esophagus. And it turned out that it was, as we just talked about, it was almost all plastic. There were pieces of balloons. There were pieces of plastic bags um, that had um, had broken down, broken up into smaller pieces that were inside the turtle, and the turtle maybe had tried to eat them. Um, and uh, anyway, we we were able to clear the material away, and as soon as the material was cleared out, the animal began to eat normally, and Kermit was successfully released back into the ocean. So that was a that was a good success story, but again, a reminder of the challenges when uh, when this plastic debris gets into the marine environment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a photo of an of an osprey. Most of you probably recognize uh, an osprey. Um, osprey are are very common in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, though they've had a rocky time of it over the last uh, thirty years. Actually, uh, more like fifty years. Um, in the nineteen seventies, they almost disappeared because of DDT, and currently the the threats they face are are the fact that there simply aren't enough of their of their uh, most desirable prey, which are menhaden available to them, and that's actually causing their populations to um, significantly suffer. And uh, that's an area we need to work on. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, these are uh, these is three osprey chicks um, in a nest, and uh, this is kind of what they look like when they're newly hatched. You can go to the next slide. This is uh, one of the ways that we uh, monitor the ospreys is we go out and we check on the nests. Uh, we work with the Center for Conservation Biology out of William & Mary, and we do, we do that work with them in the Loon Haven River system in Virginia Beach. Uh, and they, but they monitor osprey all over the bay, in, a, in all, almost all areas of the bay. Uh, one of the ways you do that is you go out and you got in a vessel and the way you check on the nest is you have a mirror on the end of a pole and you hold it up and you can look into the nest and sort of see what the nest conditions look like. And I pulled this photo because what you can see here is there's three eggs in this nest. Uh, actually, there might be four eggs in this nest, but but there's plastic wrapped around the eggs and you can see the debris that's in this nest. And I can tell you from being out there myself that the majority of the nests have some level of plastic in them. And it's because plastic is so ubiquitous out there in the environment. Often it's plastic bags, which gets entangled around the sticks that they use to build the nests. And anyway, this is this is what can happen um, in, a, in a nest, in a natural nest. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a photo of an osprey chick, obviously a little bit older chick. You can see its left talon is very well formed and very well developed. Uh, its right talon is deformed, and uh, and this was due to the fact that it was it was entangled in plastic in the nest, and uh, its its left its right talon did not develop normally, and um, unfortunately, an osprey without two healthy talons is unable to survive in the wild. And so this animal had to be humanely euthanized because of that issue. Um, again, this is the danger of plastic, uh, the ubiquitous amount of plastic in the environment and plastic that ended up in this particular nest. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this, I, I share this slide because uh, as I mentioned, we, the, the Virginia Aquarium, uh, responds to uh, manages the marine mammal and sea turtle stranding network for the state of Virginia. So we respond to any sea turtle strandings or any marine mammal strandings in the entire state. That's more than 7,000 miles of tidal shoreline. So there's a lot of a lot of area to cover, and uh, we see a lot of it. We see about 400 animals annually. That's about the average that we see. About 300 sea turtles and about 100 marine mammals. Those are, those are kind of the averages. And so we see a lot of animals, um, a lot of them are deceased, and but we always examine them because we want to understand why the animals may have died. And that's in, in learning that we can learn about the threats to the animals and then hopefully do something about it. Uh, this is sort of the poster child for plastic for us for in terms of a large animal, because this is a 55 foot say whale. And um, this animal, you, the thing, I don't have a pointer, but one of the things I'll have you look at in the picture of the large whale at the very top, uh, you can see sort of some ridges on the side of the animal. That, those are actually the animal's ribs. And so this animal is emaciated and it's a, this animal should be very robust and round and smooth on the outside with blubber. 
And those are the ribs you can see. This is an emaciated animal. And once we brought the animal to the shore and were able to do an, a necropsy, which is an animal autopsy on the animal, we found that piece of plastic in the center at the bottom in its stomach. And that plastic was very sharp. It was too large to pass through and it had it sort of damaged the inside of the stomach and the animal just stopped feeding is what we anticipate or what we uh, think happened at that point. And uh, so anyway, this piece of plastic, and when we saw it, we said it looks familiar, but in the end, and we, when we got back to the office, we finally figured out it was a broken piece of a DVD case. And, um, but anyway, that's, uh, so we've seen plastic hurt some very small animals, but we've also seen plastic potentially impact the largest animals on earth and the largest animals in the ocean. Next slide, please. So obviously less plastic makes sense. Uh, plastic is, as we've just seen and showed you, it's one of the most frequently littered items in Virginia and globally. It ends up in our streets and our waterways threatening wildlife. It ends up in farm fields and fouls equipment and spoils crops and, and the debris blocks stormwater systems and increases our flooding issues. Plastic pollution is all around us and it's in us. It breaks up into tiny plastic particles we call microplastics which are now found in the air we breathe, in water, and even in the food we and other animals eat. It's pretty much ubiquitous now that there's plastic, little tiny pieces of plastic almost everywhere. Next slide, please. The solution is as consumers and, and as producers, we need to hold people accountable for this and we need to transition away from single use plastic and towards something better. And I think that's what um, that's what all the folks that have put this webinar series together are working on in the state of Virginia. And um, I look forward to working with them and helping to be part of that solution. And I think that's the last, you can go one more. Um, that's my contact information um, if you have any questions. And I will pass it on to the next person on our team. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. And uh, a reminder, if you have questions, you can put them into the, the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And next, we're going to hear from Jen Cole from Clean Fairfax. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jen. I'm up here in Fairfax County, and I run uh, Clean Fairfax. Um, so just a quick history of Clean Fairfax. We've actually been around for a while. Um, we were established in 1979 as a task force of the Board of Supervisors, basically a bunch of squeaky wheel um, uh, residents who didn't like how much litter there was, uh, made some noise, and eventually we incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit. But one of the most important things about Clean Fairfax is that we enjoy this really unique Actually, it's not that unique. I think it's unique in Virginia, but it's a public-private partnership with um, our Department of Public Works, um, where we work with solid waste management, um, stormwater. We manage the county's litter task force, and we work on something called Operation Stream Shield, um, which actually helps put um, under-housed and under-employed people to work um, picking up um, some of the trashiest streams in our county. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, why we do this work is um, because we get, well, because we get funded to do it basically. But um, one of the most important things that we do with our relationship with the county is we help with their stormwater compliance uh, permit, their MS4 permit. Um, and we've been doing that since 2017. And it puts us in a really unique position to actually track litter around the county. Um, and we are the only entity really that we know of that is able to look at the same locations all the time for the last, um, you know, since 2017, we look at five different land uses every quarter and we literally count how much trash is there and then we pick it all up and we go back again in the quarter and what we're finding is that it's it's mostly plastic and that's a big problem most of what we find out there is plastic another piece of the problem is that we are told as a society um whether you're an environmentalist or not environmentalist or whatever that almost everything that's plastic is recyclable um that 
that the of the 40 million metric tons of plastic that's being produced, less than six of it is actually being recycled. Um, that mismanaged litter and mismanaged plastic um, turns into litter because our waste systems, which were built 35 years ago, are broken and aren't able to deal with all of this plastic that we're making. And that, again, we think that everything that's plastic is being recycled, that we're putting everything in our recycling bin, and then we're just hoping that it's going to some magical place where it's turned into unicorns, but it's not. Next slide, please. So here are just a couple slides of what it looks like on trash day uh, in Fairfax County. Um, when I, so when we say that mismanaged solid waste is a big part of the plastic pollution problem in Virginia, this is what we're look, what we were talking about. Um, because currently in Fairfax, you can put your trash out in a plastic bag 12 hours before your trash is being picked up and animals can get could go through it and we can have a storm that can come through and all of the lightweight plastic can blow out and it ends up like in a stream. And these are all pictures that we took. Um, and the thing is, is that Fairfax isn't really any different from any other locality um, in knowing that our solid waste systems are haven't kept up with the times. Um, if you were on the webinar last week and you heard our friend Charlie Forbes from Fairfax talk, he mentioned that most solid waste recycling plans were built around single family homes where you would roll your cart or your blue bin down to the street and the, your trash guy would come and pick it up. Um, and, and didn't account for things like condos and apartment complexes where space is at a premium for dumpsters and recycling cans. And all of this time, while all of this is happening, we've got more and more people moving into communities and more and more people moving into apartments, but we don't get, we're not getting more and more capacity. The plastics industry um, is churning out more and more plastic that can't be recycled or reused. And they're calling it any number of things like ocean bound plastic or upcycling or biocompostable and putting out messaging that they're doing their part to solve the problem. But here's a spoiler alert, they, they really aren't. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned in, our, in my intro, Clean Fairfax has been doing compliance monitoring of five different streams on five different land uses for Fairfax's um, municipal stormwater permit since 2017. We go out quarterly to each location. We quantify and qualify the litter we see. Then we pick it all up. Uh, and then we have um, we have like a little uh, a little pie chart where you can see. Um, so we have several years of data, and this is what it looks like. And it's a lot of single use plastic, right? So seventy seven percent of what we've been picking that we what we pick up um, is single use plastic. That's a, that's too much. Um, so. When I took this job in 2009, I said, I am gonna get us a bag bill, even if it kills me. And those of you who know me personally know it almost did kill me, but I am still alive and we have a bag bill. And based on the work of our friends at Clean Virginia Waterways, thank you, Zach, um, with the voter survey that they did to, to bring you back to the first webinar that we did, I was not the only one who wanted a bag bill. So with the voter survey, information that Clean Virginia Waterways got, we found out that Virginia voters are okay with bag bills and bag bans. So this first slide um, to remind you of what Zach told us in the very first webinar was that for the most part, people are in favor of a five cent fee on single use bags. And, uh, and then, I mean, certainly there are always gonna be people that oppose it, but this is this is sort of across the you know the political landscape here um, that people are pretty much okay with that. It wasn't overwhelmingly not in favor of it. Um, so I take that as a win. So let's go to the next slide where there's actually a ban. And you can see that people are in favor of a ban on plastic bags. And so this is the kind of information that our legislators really need to to know about because they they are getting all of their information from industry. Um, but if what Virginians want is to actually get rid of plastic bags or certainly reduce them significantly, um, then they need to know about that. 
So the question that we often get asked is how did we get the, the enabling legislation passed in Fairfax County? And I'll tell you that we took a really um, a different approach than I think I normally would have taken. And we, we took this multi-pronged approach, which we called the four E's. And we started not with the environmental argument, but with the economic argument, because that is the one that detractors love to use. Um, so we decided that we would use it first. We talked about how plastic bags have a cost to the store, to the consumer, to the locality when they become trash. We pointed out that grocery stores need one thing and one thing only to remain competitive in the market, and that is in fact groceries. We used examples of the stores and the companies that have opened within the past few years in our region, and it's Northern Virginia, you know our region is hot for groceries, and how all of them opened without giving away free plastic bags. Those are things, those are like Whole Foods, Aldi, Lidl, uh, My Organic Market, Moms, um, all of them, no, no, no free plastic bags from the get-go. Then we moved on to equity and then environment and finally exposure, the health argument. Now, I will agree, I will cop to the fact that we had a pretty friendly board of supervisors for this ordinance. However, we essentially were able to pull the rug out from under anyone who argued that the five cent bag tax, and honestly, it is a fee, um, but the way the legislation is written, it's called a tax, but whatever semantics, um, would harm stores or low income families because it was smack dab in the middle of COVID. And I always address the idea that plastic bags from China were somehow cleaner than your own bags that you brought from home. So we, we hit all of those points, as you can see in this slide, so that when then somebody came up to say, well, this disproportionately affects people low income, and say, actually, you know, the, the, the studies and the research from communities that have this say that that's not actually true. Um, and because Clean Fairfax is the one entity out in the streams, literally counting plastic and plastic bags, we talked about how plastic bags are the most littered item, more than cigarette butts in Northern Virginia. And then we talked about how harmful plastic is when it breaks down and gets into our food system. And at the end of my five minutes that I had before the Board of Supervisors, I promised that I would come back after a year and let everyone know if we were seeing fewer plastic bags in our monitoring sites. And guess what? We have been seeing fewer plastic bags in our monitoring sites. So you can see that we where the, uh, I don't have a pointer, but you can see if you can so I sort of like zoom in, if you can see into the where, the plastic bag um, tax was implemented January 1, 2022. And then you can see right the line where it absolutely we are seeing fewer plastic bags in our monitoring sites. But here is the like absolutely obscene thing. Um, Fairfax is still using a lot of plastic bags. Um, by our math, it is more than 40 million plastic bags a year based on how much the bag tax is bringing in, which is $2 million. And that is a lot of nickels. And we absolutely never anticipated that. Um, we never, never did we want this to be any kind of like money-making scheme. We really just wanted this to be a thing that meant fewer bags. But here are some of the things so far that $2 million worth of nickels has been paying for in Fairfax County. And while I don't really think it's a great way for localities to get um, uh, to be better environmental leaders, I actually think that you can lead by better policies than nickels, but you know what, at least it helps pay for those policies. Um, so you can see that we are getting trash can service at commuter lots instead of just trash cans, they're actually getting serviced. Uh, lots of uh, reusable bags being bought for SNAP and WIC clients and families. Um, GIS mapping of where the trash cans are in the Fairfax County parks, which has sort of been a bugaboo of mine. Um, compostable produce bags were bought for all the farmers markets in Fairfax County and also helps uh, fund operations stream shield, which is something that we work on as well. Some things that it could go to. If you were at last week's presentation and you heard the our friend Chrissy from uh, the city of Virginia Beach where they were talking about, you know, 
revamping or maybe getting rid of their curbside recycling program. Well, guess what? $2 million could help cover the cost of some of these programs that municipalities are finding hard to, to pay for, um, like curbside recycling programs, supporting farmers markets and force a plastic free farmers market. Um, you know, creating a buying club for swapping out single use products for small businesses and food trucks. I'm going to talk a little bit about foam at the very end of my presentation. Um, solid waste system upgrades, dumpster days, which is something that we have here in my county where I live in, in Prince William County. Um, curbside compost programs, pretty much anything that would enhance the natural and built environment in your locality can be paid for with the bag tax. So, um, if I'm not sure why some communities won't even consider it, they won't even bring it up for a vote. They're, they just say, no, it's a tax, it's regressive, it's whatever. But here's the thing, really hold, if you're, if you're dialing in from a community and you've been trying to get the bag fee passed, really hold your leader's feet to the fire and, and make them say, I know that we can get cash money to do this work, but honestly, we don't care enough. Make them say that. Because I mean, this, I, I am so gobsmacked by the amount of money that Fairfax County is bringing in. And I, I don't even know how much Alexandria and Arlington and Loudoun and um, Arlington are all bringing in. But I, I mean, it's got to be, you know, we, we, we bringing in more than $5 million a year for environmental projects for Northern Virginia. And why anyone would turn their nose up at that is beyond me. Okay, so what's next? So we can take some pretty valuable lessons from the bag tax, namely that good environmental policy begets good environmental improvement, i.e. less plastic bags in the wild. Um, we also can see a pretty strong return on investment despite the fact that consumers are still using bags. Because we're seeing fewer bags out there, at least it's an opportunity for environmental funding in Fairfax County, which you know, I mean, money doesn't grow on trees, but certainly we can pick it up off the ground. So the question though, is this really sustainable? And I'm not really sure um, because really what I'd like to see is for nobody to be using plastic bags and no money to be coming in on bag tax. So I don't know how sustainable it is, but I do think it's a step in the right direction. And now that we've seen that these top-down systemic changes, also known as policy, um, instead of always asking for consumers to do the work, um, actually renders real results. And it's time to ask what else these policy changes can apply to. Um, like, you know, plastic bags aren't the only plastic litter that we see in Fairfax County. We see a lot of plastic bottles, lots and lots of plastic bottles, all of which should be in a recycling bin and aren't. Um, we see a lot of styrofoam and foam containers, which cannot be recycled. And yet, maybe we should get rid of styrofoam and foam containers. We have PFOS, which I think you're going to hear a lot about coming up. These are those forever chemicals that are getting into our water and getting into our systems and getting into animals and fish and other single use plastic items like you know, like straws and forks and utensils and, and honestly things that we don't need because we all have straws and forks and utensils at home. Um, so I think it's maybe time to rethink the whole shell game of recycling. And so we put together this graphic that reminds us that it's not just reduce, reuse, recycle anymore. It's rethink, it's refuse, like rethink the packaging on something when you're buying it. Um, it's refuse um, plastic utensils when you're getting something to go, especially if you're taking it home or to the office because you have utensils there. It's reduce the amount of plastic in your life. It's reuse whatever it is that you end up getting. It's repair. Um, you, you probably are seeing some pieces of legislation around the country called right to repair, which basically allows people to repair products without voiding the warranty. Um, repurpose things. Um, those buy nothing groups are kind of awesome. When you don't want something anymore, instead of throwing it into the landfill or your trash can, see if you can find somebody who, who needs that. Rot, which is composting, actual composting. 
And then recycle is the last thing. So if we can try to, to reframe like all of the things that come into our lives on a daily basis and try to look at them through this new sort of rainbow chasing arrows and make sure that that at the very end we're recycling something, but we're trying to do all of these other things first, we'll probably see less plastic. So this takes me to the big takeaway slide. The too long didn't read. Um, we need to make and use less plastic. That's that's number one. We need to like just stop making and stop using so much plastic. Um, and we need to be aware of the kind of greenwashing by big oil and big plastic that guilts us into feeling like this is a problem for individuals to solve. Um, but at this point in the game, the onus really lies less with individual actions, although those are important and we should always be doing those individual actions and more with big company actions and wholesale adjustments to the systems like bag taxes or bottle bills or extended producer responsibilities and things like legislating the kinds of plastics that can be made and requiring that they that we meet a certain recycling rate. Um, we need to change the um, to, to, we need to change the scale of the amount of, of plastic that we're making in order to stop the bleeding of this plastic um, so that we try to make laws that govern plastic like we do almost everything else and not just cross our fingers and hope that people and individuals and corporations just do the right thing for the environment. Because 75 years of recycling hasn't actually solved the problem. And recycling, again, is just one piece of the solution. It's not the only solution. So finally, one of the other things that I wanted to talk about is this. One of the things that we, we started working on a couple of years ago is Litter Free Virginia, which we like to call our side hustle, which we put together with a bunch of partners. And it's a website where we just use as a clearinghouse for statewide litter policy and advocacy. Um, and it, the mission is just to advocate for good environmental policy and keep um, other nonprofits and Virginians up to date on what is going on in, um, in the state house in Richmond, as well as what's going on sort of around us so that we can look at best practices. Um, and some of the work that we did as a group was the single use plastic bag legislation, uh, the balloon release, we were able to increase the Virginia litter tax two different ways. Um, we did get an expanded polystyrene, that's a styrofoam food ban, um, uh, but it unfortunately, we're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, and and we uh, have constantly are talking about what we're gonna do about a bottle bill. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think that one of the most thing, oh, sorry, I just, I thought I had another slide, but I was going to talk a little bit about the EPS foam ban, because I think that's important, because that was a bill that we got passed in 2021 to ban foam food containers, so styrofoam food containers, um, where they were going to phase out of styrofoam by this past summer for businesses with 20 or more locations. So that would be, you know, McDonald's, you know, um, uh, Chick-fil-A. And honestly, most of the big companies that have 20 or more restaurants in Virginia have already phased out polystyrene, um, not Chick-fil-A. Um, and then for businesses with fewer, um, it would, it, it would go into effect in 2025. But last year in the 2022 special budget amendment, they delayed the phase out ban by five years. So now it's 2028 and 2030. Um, foam continues to be one of the most common and damaging pollutants in Virginia, especially considering its end life. Um, it doesn't naturally biodegrade. It just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces, which are really impossible to pick up. They're easily ingested by wildlife and they make their way into us as microplastics. And also on the front end, um, you know, they're made from like styrene and benzene, which are cancer causing. Um, you, you really don't want to be eating thing, eating hot things out of things that are polystyrene if you can help it. 
Um, and we actually have some really informative um, EPS information on our litterfreeva.org page. Okay, now we can get to my last slide. And I will thank you for your time. And I will leave you with a quote from one of my favorite authors that maybe will resonate with you as you move forward in your own journey to move away from, um, to move towards policies that will reduce our plastic addiction. And that is stop blaming individuals for their choices when the problem lies with systems and their failures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Um, last, Molly will give us an update on Virginia Beach. Thanks, Zach. Um, so really quickly, um, uh, my name is Molly Riley. I'm the Pearl Business and Advocacy Coordinator for Living River Now. Lindham River now um, has been in Virginia Beach for over 20 years now. We started in 2002 with the goal of cleaning up the Lynn Haven um, to make it trout fish harvestable again. Um, in 2002, only 1% was harvestable, um, but now 20, over 20 years later, more than 50% is harvestable. And we do this through a variety of uh, policy work as well as restoration work and public education and outreach as well. Um, so we're really focused right now on trying to get a bag fee implemented in the city of Virginia Beach. Next slide, please. So why are we so concerned about Virginia Beach? Um, well, it's an area that has a lot of water and a lot of people. And when you have a lot of people, you're gonna have, unfortunately, a lot of plastic and a lot of trash. And we are the Southern portion of the city where we have our Southern Rivers watershed. You're, we're getting the downstream effects of plastic washing from other cities upstream, as well as plastic that's being used and littered in our own backyard. Um, and we have a number of sensitive watersheds in our, our area between the Back Bay uh, watershed, um, as well as Chesapeake Bay. Um, and, you know, these are, this should look pretty familiar because of some of the sites where Mark was doing his surveying and pulling out the turtles and just, you know, plastic are uh, in this area. So um, we want to be able to be contributing to the solution and not um, sitting on our hands while this is happening um, in our backyard. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that LR Now does is we have a monthly cleanup. Um, we have hundreds of volunteers every year come out the second Saturday of every month to help us clean up trash. And the most common items that we collect um, are plastic bags, um, plastic beverage bottles, and cigarette butts. But um, just to give you an idea of the scope of how much we're collecting, since 2003, we've removed over 35 tons of trash uh, from the waterways in Virginia Beach. Um, and just alone in 2023, we've already removed 10,000 pounds, again, mostly plastic. And, and plastic bags and plastic balls, they don't weigh very much. So you can just imagine the scale of how many we need to be collecting in order to be over 10,000 pounds worth of plastics that we're taking out pretty much by hand. Um, and this was a turtle that we found just the other day at a cleanup, unfortunately, snagged in a plastic bag. Um, and it's, you know, it's we're seeing this more frequently um, as, as consumption of single-use plastics increases. Next slide, please. Um, so the last two years, we've had a great group of uh, environmental nonprofits as well as community organizations working to educate people in Virginia Beach and the Hampton Roads area more on plastics issues um, and why a bag fee makes sense for us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the benefits that uh, my colleagues have already spoken to, but we also just Virginia Beach, we're a really big tourism economy. People want to come here for the clean beaches and clean water. And you know, we have anglers and kayakers that want to come out and enjoy wildlife um, and to fish. And you know, it's not gonna be very fun if you're just catching plastic bags or um, you know, just having to remove uh waste on the beach before you can, you know, set y'all for yourself and your family. Um, and this is a plastic bag in a recycling uh, container because uh, we also have a big problem with contamination in our recycling stream. Um, that's also uh, creating other waste problems. And now we're potentially going to lose our recycling services because it's become so cost prohibitive with all the contamination. And plastic bags will also damage machinery um, at recycling facilities, uh, which is part of why TFC has been very supportive of bag fees. 
Um, and it also can get into farm equipment as well. The southern portion of the city is very agricultural. Um, so they're seeing some different types of impacts as well. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges that we're dealing with right now is, you know, this is a very large, diverse area. We have a lot of young people who are very transient in their lifestyle because uh, the U.S. military is the largest employer in our area. Um, so it's hard to reach people to talk to them and educate them when they're not home, maybe six, eight months of the year, if, if not more. Um, and anytime we're adding a quote unquote new cost, um, that can be politically challenging. But as Jen said, you know, this is this is not a new cost. Uh, we're just taking an internalized cost and making it more external and more transparent. But we're all paying for the cost of these bags in many ways. We were excited that the Virginia Beach City Council adopted the Zero Waste Awareness Week recently. So now that will be designated the first week of September every year, which is, I think is a great step in, in the right direction. Um, and we'd like to see the bag fee follow as more sort of concrete steps towards that mission of, of zero waste, reducing our waste. And we've also had the sort of a similar conversation with um, the Virginia Beach Human Rights Commission bringing up that, you know, is this going to impact um, the economically disadvantaged people in our community, um, despite monies from the fee being designated to helping people buy bags? Um, you know, we understand that that is a concern for people. So we try to do a couple of things to, to change that conversation. Next slide. <clears throat> so two things that we've done. Um, we started a reusable bag collection program. Um, so we have dozens of sites all over the city where people can bring their new or gently used bags uh, to a collection site. You know, it's a lot of our rec centers um, and churches have uh, boxes where people can toss in some bags that they don't need. And then we will go around the city and collect them and then distribute them to food pantries and shelters so that uh, people who don't have access to bags are, are getting them in hand. And we've also had a lot of sewing workshops, um, collecting old fabric and upcycling it into uh, bags that we give away to people as well. So next slide. Um, so we launched a survey that we are trying to get out to uh, anyone who lives in Virginia Beach um, to ask them a few questions on four key things. So we were trying to figure out how many residents are already using reusable bags. If not, what are the barriers? Um, are people concerned and aware of the plastic pollution problem? Uh, also, would they support a five cent bag fee? And so far, um, it's been overwhelmingly supportive. We've had over 900 residents respond to the survey so far. Um, and uh, close to 90% uh, have said that they would support the bag fee. Um, and the most common reason that people uh, cited as a barrier to why they are not using reusable bags already is that they just forget them at home or in their car. Like they like the idea of it, but they just kind of forget to take the steps to change the habit. So we're trying to uh, have lots of workshops about creating you know, ways to change our habits. Um, and we started these uh, little sticker decals you can put on your windshield um, in the lower hand of your dash that says, don't want to nag, but grab a bag. And that way, when you get into your car, you'll see it. It'll remind you to grab your bags for your shopping trip. And then you can you know, not forget your bags at home and go shopping with them. Next slide. Um, so we need Virginia Beach residents to help us out though in this, in this effort. We made a lot of great progress through the reusable bag collection program and, and a lot of our uh, out outreach and education work there on the city. But we'd really appreciate it that if you're a Virginia Beach resident that you can uh, scan the QR code with your phone for our survey and our petition, and then be able to pass it on to a friend. We're also really encouraging people to write letters to the editor or contact their city council representative and support Virginia Beach adopting a five cent bag fee. Next slide. So that's all I had to share. Um, and leave with a quote from Margaret Mead that never have doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Molly. And thank you to the rest of our speakers today. And a, another reminder that you can fill out the Q&A form in the chat if you have a, a question you want us to get to at any point in the future. And we're also sharing 
um, some resources and actions in the chat. So if you've not already done so, please check them out to learn more and get involved. Um, and we'll include these in a follow-up email along with how you can watch the recording of this webinar and the other two as well. Um, and that is all we have time for today. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you to the, the partner organizations who were able to pull this together. Uh, Environment Virginia, Lynn Haven River Now, Clean Fairfax, and us at Clean Virginia Waterways. And a special thank you to Ellie from Environment Virginia, who uh, led us through this. Without her, we would not have been able to pull this off. And again, we'll be sending a follow-up email with the resources and the links to these recordings. And we appreciate you spending your afternoon with us for these last three weeks. Thank you.